So our next presenter is going to be um, Professor Seb Crutch, who's going to talk about the neuropsychology. Thank you, Roberta, and thank you, Gemma. Um, so my job really is to talk about dementia-related visual impairment, and uh, I suppose my introduction to this sort of combination of vision and dementia came when I had the great privilege of working with this gentleman, William Utemolen, who is a renowned artist who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1995. Now, Bill's initial symptoms were those traditionally associated with Alzheimer's disease in, in the sense of memory problems. But what was, became really quite apparent was that also gradually as the disease spread, he also had increasing difficulties with visual um, aspect, visual perception, seeing what and where things are. Um, and some people, you could argue that um, changes in his self-portraits, which are so powerful, may have been artistic style changing, as well as his visual skills. But one example I often draw on is when we ask Bill simply to draw a man. And what he created is, you may, some of you will be able to see on the screen, and I'll describe for those of you who um, can't, is a very stylish, elegantly dressed man with a jacket and a tie blowing in the wind, infinitely better than anything I could create, some sort of stick man I would draw. But when he finished drawing it, Bill looked at it and he said, hmm, no, no, there's something wrong. But he couldn't spot what was wrong. And he couldn't spot um, that he'd drawn both arms protruding from the same shoulder socket. And that, for me, is a good example of a spatial error, a difficulty seeing where something is or should be. What I'm going to talk about for the rest of my um, uh, talk is specifically about the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease known, as you've heard, as PCA, posterior cortical atrophy, which are three posh words which literally mean back of the brain shrinkage. And in 90% or so of people with PCA, that's caused by Alzheimer's disease, affecting where the plaques and tangles, for reasons we don't fully yet understand, affect the back of the brain, the visual parts of the brain, rather than the memory parts of the brain that we typically think of. But the reason I want to talk to you about PCA is not just because it's relevant to people with this relatively rare expression of dementia, but also because the stories, as we've had the great privilege of hearing for many years in this group, of people with this specific visual form of Alzheimer's disease have great importance and relevance to people living with so-called typical dementia, like Bill, who at some point may well go on to have visual problems difficulty seeing what and where things are, but perhaps at a point at which they can't articulate it as clearly um, as many members of this group can. So I'm talking about a rare form of dementia, but I think probably 80 to 90% of people with that typical Alzheimer's disease and many other dementia-causing diseases will at some point experience some aspects of what I'm talking to you about. So if you've not met someone with posterior cortical atrophy before, then this is a fairly typical story. This was the first, uh, this was from the paper um, by someone called Frank Benson, an American neurologist who first described this syndrome back in the late 80s. And I'll just read out loud to you um, one of the met gentlemen he met in his clinic. A 64-year-old former bank executive presented with episodes of anxiety that complicated a slowly progressive disturbance of vision and language. About eight years earlier, he had noted difficulty reading he remained at his job, but his secretary had to read to him. Although still able to write, he could not read what he produced. Eventually, he also lost the ability to write and had difficulty finding his way in familiar areas and in performing visually mediated tasks. The problem slowly progressed. He stated that what he saw disappeared before he could sense what it was. On examination, he was alert, oriented, attentive, and in reasonably good physical health. His manner was gracious, and his insight was painfully apparent. Now, for most people, that is not a description of dementia. And that is something we talk frequently about in this group, because arguably people with PCA, certainly in the early stages, do not have dementia as it was classically defined. People with PCA are not out of their mind in that literal Greek translation of what this word means. And more subtly, it certainly contravenes many of the public stereotypes about dementia. These are specific visual problems due to, this is brain sight loss, not eyesight loss. People living with PCA, the vast majority, have very good eye health, ocular health. 
this is a difficulty of how the brain interprets the information coming in from the outside world. Let me show you a couple of videos of people, members of our group, who very generously agreed to be videoed to describe to others in situations like this some of the difficulties they have. Um, this gentleman took part in a project which you'll hear a bit more uh, about later called Which Test is Best, a joint project with the College of Optometrists. Um, and this is someone being interviewed by a neurologist who's um, performing a very simple test to see about this difficulty with spatial perception, difficulty seeing where something is. Now, I'd like you to look at my nose. Keep looking at my nose. And I'm going to put my hands out, and I'm going to move my hand. And if you see my hand moving, can you reach and grab it? So look at my nose. <laughs> there you are. Got it. Well done. Look at my nose. You look at my nose. Can you find my hand. Can you see my hand moving? No, I can see your nose. Can you see a hand at all? Can you see my hand moving? No. Uh, is that keeping my yeah. Keep looking at me. Can you see my hand moving? Can you see my hand moving? Yeah. Can you see my hand moving? Yes. Grab it yes. for me. Where is it? <laughs> where is it? You got it? God, where is it? You'll find it in a minute. Wow. Well, ah. <laughs> you got it. Very good. Well done. Okay. Okay, so this gentleman understands exactly what he is being asked to do. He repeats the task. But at points, he doesn't even see a hand. And then even when he does realize that the hand is there, his brain's ability to do the quick maths that most of us very fortunately take for granted of working out how far, left, right, up, down, and putting our hand there, are damaged. Now, of course, this is a relatively severe example of someone with a spatial problem. But it doesn't take much imagination to imagine what would just having a little bit of this problem mean for you if you were driving a car or reading a book and trying to get your eyes from the beginning of end of one line to the beginning of the next or reaching out to pick up a cup and so as Gemma mentioned so clumsiness as perceived from the outside may often be one of the early signs that someone is having these visual difficulties it's not that they're clumsy or careless in that sort of traditional pejorative interpretation it's that they literally cannot see where that thing is or can see with a slight degree of error where that thing is. So that's difficulty seeing where something is. In the next video, you will hear someone describing, sorry, yeah, what was that? Um, describing, tr attempting to describe this picture. They were shown this picture and simply asked, can you tell me what you see? And for those of you who don't have a visual problem, you may be able to detect very rapidly, probably within four or 500 milliseconds, pretty much what the scene is. This is a picture of Brighton Pier, for those of you who can't see it. And this is the description of someone trying to puzzle out what is before them. It looks like a, a park or, um, or maybe a station or a building. So it looks a bit like um, the thing they're trying to elect for the, uh, the Olympics. <laughs> Or it could be the beach, because down here it looks a bit sandy. Yeah, it looks like Brighton, Brighton, or somewhere like that. That's where you're looking at it. So again, for those of us with um, intact vision, we are able to see that what this lady is talking about makes complete sense. When she's talking about, oh, maybe it's a railway line, perhaps she's looking at the legs of the pier and thinking they look a bit like the sleepers, those regular lines. When she talks about maybe it's the stadium they're trying to erect for the Olympics, maybe she's looking at the sort of dome at the end and thinking it looks like a sports stadium. But she's intelligent, she's using all the information, the stored knowledge, her preserved memories, her intellect to draw together all these pieces of the puzzle. And what I'm able to do in 400, 3, 4, 100 milliseconds takes her 10, 15, 20 seconds. But she does get there because she's bright, because she's able, because she's drawing on everything else which isn't damaged by her condition in order to do the task. But it is like, put the, the, seeing the world is like putting together a very complex jigsaw puzzle. 
And why is this happening? Well, many people um, who've been um, through this research program generously at UCL contributed to this study, which compared the brain scans of 48 people living with PCA, the visual form of Alzheimer's disease, and uh, almost 30 people with the typical memory-led form. And what you see in front of you are the two sides of a brain, where the hot colours represent the areas where there is more uh, cell, brain cell loss in people with PCA, and you'll see that that's particularly at the back of the brain, um, the so-called occipital and parietal lobes. And the blue or cold colours indicate the areas where there's more brain cell loss in the people with the memory-led form of Alzheimer's disease, and that's more in the sort of medial temporal um, lobes. Um, and there's, but the thing to emphasise here is there is a lot of overlap. Memory-led Alzheimer's disease and PCA form of Alzheimer's disease really are a continuum. There are some people with profound visual loss who have no memory problems to start with, people with profound memory problems who don't seem to have any difficulty with our visual tests, but lots of people in the middle who have a bit of both, perhaps more of one, perhaps more of the other. And we know as these diseases spread over time, it is inevitable visual loss, the Alzheimer's disease spreading into the visual parts of the brain is a question of when, not if, for the vast majority of people. So even if it happens very late in someone's journey with dementia, visual loss is something we have to be, get be on top of. One of the um, wonderful uh, things about this group is that the group challenged the researchers. I hope this is a, a jointly led group. Um, one gentleman uh, called Simon Rosser once stood up in one of these meetings uh, quite rightly and justifiably frustrated by the fact that some people were talking about PCA some people were talking about visual variants of Alzheimer's disease. Some people were talking about biparietal Alzheimer's disease. Some people were talking about Benson syndromes. And he just said, don't you guys talk to each other? Don't you have a common definition of what this problem is that you're facing? And so, prompted by him, we pulled together a group of about 25 centers around the world who've worked with people with this condition. And the agreement that we, is a triangular structure on the screen in front of you, for those who can't see, at which the top of the triangle is PCA, this definition of a progressive syndrome affecting as different aspects of vision. Um, but the bottom level is saying, in some people, we can identify, if we've got the right information or the right tests, we can identify not only that they have this syndrome PCA, which is a, just a description of the problems that people are facing, but also we can have an under, I, idea about the cause so, for example, if you've got Alzheimer's disease causing your PCA, we call that PCA-AD. We do know that in a small number of people, PCA can also be caused by other conditions like dementia with Lewy bodies, a condition called corticobasal degeneration, and in some people by prion diseases. Those are relatively rare, but we're, we have to be aware that there are some differences. But the good news about that the majority of um, people with PCA having Alzheimer's diseases if or hope, very hopefully when we have treatments for typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease, there is no current reason to think they wouldn't be equally effective for people with PCA. But of course, you don't want to put someone into a trial if you don't think it's Alzheimer's disease causing their visual problems. Um, one thing that has been a core part of our work um, has been to build on the wonderful foundations laid down by an extraordinary woman called Elizabeth Warrington, who's a professor of neuropsychology at UCL. And she, um, through a number of groundbreaking studies from the 50s onwards, has created a series of visual tests that mean that one, it's not rocket science to work out if someone has a visual difficulty. So this is just a, an example of a very convenient um, pocket-sized book that any of you could buy from the Institute of Neurology, which has um, tests of different types of vision. So some of the tests uh, attack really basic aspects of vision. So can someone differentiate between a square and an oblong, or see you know, on a speckled background whether there's a shape present or not? So tests which tap really into sort of aspects of very early occipital brain function but also tests of object perception, which tends to rely uh, more on the so-called uh, ventral stream of processing in the brain, the lower parts of the visual system. Space perception, which tends to rely more on superior, higher parts of the brain system. And also other tests like face perception. I've met somebody already today um, who said that one of their first symptoms was recognizing their husband's face. And that, again, that's a very common early symptom for people with PCA, 
and also measures things like reading. So simple tools that are available that could be used by any eye health professional, not just a specialist neurologist, just to check out whether someone has brain sight loss in addition to any eyesight loss they may have. One comment, of course, is uh, like uh, all forms of dementia, PCA is progressive. These are some brain scans shown in top um, of one gentleman who came to us very early in his condition and then was scanned over almost a 10-year period. And they, these scans are all registered back to this first scan so that the cold colours that you see emerging at the back of the brain are showing where t brain tissue is being lost over time. And again, it's this very clear signature that the changes are not all over the brain indiscriminately. They're very much focused on the back of the brain, on the visual centres. But it's, of course, worth mentioning that PCA isn't just a visual condition. As this disease spread, it affects other skills, other sensory skills, the ability to coordinate different senses, language problems and, and, and memory problems can emerge. And when they do, it doesn't mean you don't have PCA. It just means the disease is spreading. But also it's worth thinking about the challenges that this brings because it's not just the ability to see, explicitly see the, the visual world. It's about, to un it's about spatial um, and perceptual abilities more generally. So um, people with eyesight, pure eyesight loss, might still be able to close their eyes and imagine their kitchen and work out how they would, for example, which cupboard they would go to to fetch a plate. Someone with PCA would have a great deal of difficulty with that because it's not just the explicit vision, it's the visual imagery, the ability to manipulate <coughs> spatial images and memories and those sorts of things, which mean that many of the aids appropriate for someone with pure eyesight loss may be ineffective or much more of a struggle for people with PCA. So I think the last uh, couple of points I wanted to make were again um, to, emph were to emphasize the huge importance of listening to the experiences of people living with these conditions because in our experience the greatest pleasure of doing research with members of the PCA support group is that they are inspiring the research that we do. Many of the studies we do only come about because people have been generous enough to share their experiences and tell us what's difficult. So just a couple of quick examples. One lady, Elizabeth and I worked with, um, uh, describes how when she first started noticing difficulty with reading, she went off to her local library and got a so-called easy-to-read book. And that had larger print. And she actually made, found that that completely stopped her reading. And so when we did a few tests with her where we showed her single letters, single numbers or words in different font sizes, she, as it turns out, like many other people with PCA, has much greater difficulty reading large print than normal size print. And that's because the, there's this essentially a, a re reduction in the effective field of vision. She's not blind in the periphery, but as you saw in the video of someone uh, with the, describing the Brighton Pier um, photograph, it's pockmarked. So if something is very big, you have to take several snapshots at it, and it's like having a puzzle with lots of pieces. If something is small and the right size, sometimes it can be viewed as a single piece and be easier to perceive. Um, contradictorally, or in, a, in, in complement to that, once I was administering um, one of Elizabeth's memory tests to someone, and the very first word, um, it was a memory test where you see some printed words and you try and remember them. The first word was sand. And this lady sat across from me and she said, well, I can see the S and I can see the D, but I don't know what the letters are in the middle. And it turns out, um, as Keir Young has, done, um, has led in his um, elegant work on what turns out to be called visual crowding, that people with PCA have... Uh, a difficulty with clutter. When there are lots of things close together, it's very difficult to see particularly what the middle items are. If you spread items out or make the world less cluttered, then it's much easier to identify what things are. So if we just pull those two patient-led examples of research findings together into how do you test someone's vision, and you think about a standard acuity chart, for someone with PCA, the vast majority of whom have very good acuity, this can't be read because it's too big. And this is the right size, but it's all crowded together. All you've got to do, and again, to use the phrase, it's not what, uh, what the comedian Rich Hall would call, it's not rocket surgery, <laughs> show letters individually. Because then there's, they're the right size, but they're not crowded, they're not cluttered. And it's those sorts of small challenges, uh, small improvements to practice and lessons that can be learned if you listen to people. 
living with these conditions. Another comment, um, one of Elizabeth's standard tests is for spatial abilities is dot counting. Simply show someone a piece of paper with between five and nine dots on it and say, could you tell me how many dots there are? One lady I did that with, with PCA, she looked at me and she said, well, oh, it's terribly difficult to count them when they're all moving. <laughs> and then I wasn't moving, she wasn't moving, the table wasn't moving, there wasn't an earthquake. And it turns out when we sat this lady in front of an eye tracker that she actually had these tiny movements in her eye that she wasn't aware of, that we hadn't previously been aware of. So what you see on the screen in front of you is a, the simplest experiment I've ever run, where you put one dot on the screen, and then you ask a group of people with PCA, with typical Alzheimer's disease, or people who don't have either of those conditions, just look at the dot for a few seconds. And someone who doesn't have either of these conditions can do that without moving their eyes pretty well. Someone with typical Alzheimer's disease has a number of these small square wave jerks, but basically can keep their eyes on the dot. Someone with PCA not only has these square wave jerks, but sometimes the eyes just flick away, and something that was in focus is suddenly lost. And it goes back to that description in, in the Benson case of sometimes things seem to disappear. And it's not, I mean, I have no idea how it must feel to have things disappearing on you. I would imagine incredibly unnerving particularly if you're driving and it's a car coming towards you or something dramatic like that. But that is what is happening, and it's not under voluntary control. These are changes in the eye movement system because of this degradation of the ability to represent the spatial world around us. The final example before I stop talking is another comment that came out um, when we were developing something called the Stages of PCA, which is a, a document co-written with members of the group which tries to outline what are the different um, uh, difficulties that people have experienced and what order do they happen in. And one lady st stood up and related the fact that recently her mother had asked her, am I the right way up? Now I'd suggest to you that unless you have been impressively drunk or very seasick, you probably haven't had to ask yourself that question very often. And it, but it causes philosophical interest. How do we know if we're the right way up? It turns out the neuroscience people we've spoken to, there is no one brain cell that will tell you that's the sort of upright brain cell, is this extraordinarily complicated combination of your visual sense, your vestibular or balance inner ear sense, your proprioceptive sense, the sort of information your body gives your brain about where the different limbs are. And all these things have to combine in order for me to stand upright or to adjust my posture. And again, classic example, as soon as she said, related this question, am I the right way up? One person in the group said is, oh, I can't bring my husband to the support group meetings anymore because when we walk, he walks like this. And I say to him, you're bent over. And he says, no, I'm not. And someone else in the group who was there said, sometimes I'm walking along the pavement and I feel like I'm about to fall off the edge of the world. So he's upright, but he doesn't feel he's upright. So it can go both ways. Again, hugely unnerving. It's got huge inspiration for neuroscientific practice. So we're running a study which many people here have taken part in. Um, testing people's visual and balance sense together to understand um, how much that's distorted. It's inspired artwork in some of artists, Charlie Harrison and Charlie Murphy here at the Hub. It has implications for people as diverse as dance practitioners about why might someone not want to join in a dance session, dance for dementia session. Well, maybe it's not because they're not keen. Maybe it's because spinning feels like falling or that there's been some disorientation. And it's got a lot of clinical applications. One member of our, former member of our group, when he became quite um, affected by his condition, was being looked after at home, and his wife kept being told by the paid carers, oh, he's very resistive today. And occasionally, he was accused of hitting them. And it turned out when you looked a little bit closer that it happened usually when he was being rolled in bed and moved in bed. And perhaps for that man, I don't know, but perhaps for that man, being rolled felt like falling. And if I felt like I was falling, Doing that would be a pretty reasonable response. So even, even if there's nothing you can do about it, just by being aware that conditions like PCA spread beyond vision into things like balance might significantly impact the way in which you or the person you're looking after is regarded by yourselves or other carers. And it's those sorts of implications which you simply do not get unless you listen to people living with these conditions. So I'm going to stop there, just to remind you in conclusion that this is, um, what I've been talking about is issues of brain sight, not eyesight loss, but of course well, people may have eyesight loss in addition, which can really complicate. And because of the unusualness of these symptoms, PCA is often underdiagnosed or very slow to be diagnosed. There's a definitely distinction between the so-called syndrome, PCA is a descriptive term, 
and the diseases which cause it, which are most commonly Alzheimer's disease. And as I said, people with PCA have a huge amount to tell, not just us interested in PCA, but all of us who have any interest or experience in living with or supporting or caring for people living with any kind of dementia, because this is not only them who have visual problems. Thank you for your attention.